You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your hosts, Josh Furlong and Robert Jackson. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I'm Josh Furlong, joined with my co-host, Robert Jackson. And today we're going to be previewing the Oregon State game. Uh, Oregon State Beavers come into Salt Lake City, Rice Eccles Stadium, on Saturday at 12 o'clock for an afternoon game. Joining us today to talk about that is Nick Daschle of the Oregonian. He covers the Oregon State Athletics. Uh, Nick, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Are, are you making the flight into to Salt Lake City this weekend, or are you staying in Corvallis? No, yeah, no, yeah. I'm 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 flying to Salt Lake uh, tomorrow. Um, yeah, I actually live in the Portland area, and I drive down to Corvallis a lot, so um, I do a lot of driving. <laughs> I bet that's 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 not a bad drive. I mean, it's it's not great sometimes, but it's not terrible either. No, it's not. It's not a good drive at all because I'm. <laughs> A lot of times I've hit in rush hour, and I I've got to go through all of it where I live, and it's it's not good, but it is what it is. The joys of covering a team, but at least you know yeah. it's it's fun to be able to to be up in Portland. I, I Portland's one of my favorite cities, so uh, you can't really argue with uh, being up there in my mind. So yeah, yeah. So obviously we have a uh, another big game for Oregon State. Uh, they got USC last week. Uh, it came down to the wire. What, what was it like? Something forty-one seconds left in the game, and Chance Nolan throws an interception. Kind of break down that game just uh, briefly. Um, kind of what what do you think went into to that game, and and why Oregon State was able to be so successful against USC, even though they came out with a loss in the end. Well, I mean, in, in the end, the difference was turnovers. Oregon State had four and USC had none. And, and you know, if Oregon State plays a clean game in that respect, I'm pretty sure they win the game because USC scored 10 of their 17 off turnovers. And, I mean, really, their only, their only touchdown drive of, you know, of, of their creation was, was the final one. And even in that, there was a fourth and six, you know, at midfield that USC, it was pretty miraculous how they converted it. And so... Or, I mean, Oregon State, I think that's kind of where their their defense had its, you know, we've known that their defense is getting better. You know, uh, Trent Bray took over the defense late last year from Tim Tibisar when he got fired after the Colorado loss. And we've known it's been getting better. Um, but we, we need to see it against, you know, a quality opponent. And, and I'm, and I think, you know, USC qualifies as that sort of a. Well, and they really, they really, am, they really handcuff USC for most of the night. They put a lot of pressure on Caleb Williams. He, you know, he was under pressure a lot. He didn't get sacked a lot, but he, but he threw with a lot of, a lot of pressure, and he wasn't able to. He, he, I, at one point in the game, I think he was three out of thirteen. Um, you know, there's the Oregon State secondary is it's one of the better secondaries in the, in the conference. I mean, in fact, I, I think Saturday we're probably going to see the two best secondaries in the conference, you know, in Salt Lake, um, you know, in the, in the back end, they've got a lot of experience. They got at least one NFL guy in the cornerback, Rajon Wright. Um, you know, they got a seventh year safety and Jaden Grant, Alex Austin has, has been a starting corner for three years. They've got a real big hitting safety in Katana Ladapo. He, he had, uh, he had a career high, I think it was 16 tackles a few weeks ago against Fresno State. So, yeah, that's really where the strength of that defense is. And and, and they pretty well controlled USC's receivers, except for that, that final drive where safety just got late and you know, it was a touchdown. Hey Nick. Hey Nick. Thanks for uh, for joining us here on this podcast. Uh, just to kind of uh, recap what you were saying against USC, do you anticipate – this upcoming matchup to be a defensive slugfest with Utah, or do you see it reminiscent of last year where both teams were able to move the ball up and down? And I think it was like 42 to 34. Uh, it's kind of like a shootout. Do you see it being more of a defensive slugfest in this one? I mean, if I was, to, if I had to pick one or the other, I'd say it's probably going to lean more toward the lower score than a higher scoring game. But I mean, as you know, in the PAC 12, anything's possible. Um, you know, Chance Nolan didn't have a good game last week, and I, I, I think he bounces back. 
So maybe the offense gets a little bit better. The, the thing that's really you know, the difference between this year's offense and, and last year is the running game. The running game game's been good, good enough, but it's not it's not elite like last year. They just seem to be lacking that little bit of explosiveness uh, on on run plays. Keeping drives alive, they're they're getting in too many third and long situations. Whereas last year, they 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 got a lot, they got a lot of third and short situations because they were able to, you know, get four yards, five yards on first down and 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 move and keep and keep the the down and distance manageable. So, yeah, I I kind of think it's going to be. I picked a twenty seven twenty Utah, but so I kind of think it's in that neighborhood, but. I, in this league, you know, shoot anything possible. Nick, uh, you know, obviously, did, like you mentioned, Chance Nolan has, has been effective for Oregon State. He had four turnovers in that game against USC, and the fact that they were able to be effective and, and really take it down to the wire says something about what Oregon State's been able to do. But does this feel, uh, at least in your eyes, that it's kind of up to Chance Nolan to be able to lead this team? Like, everybody else is kind of doing what they need, and I don't want to put all that pressure on one person, but do you do you feel like this team goes as well as he goes? Um, yeah, probably against the better teams. I mean, you, you gotta, I mean, people are, people are down on Chance right now, but you got to remember, he's, he's the one that was lights out in the, in the fourth quarter against Fresno State. If he, you know, if he doesn't do what he did, they don't win that game. I mean, he was, he was electric in those last six, seven minutes when, when they needed him to be good, he was great. Um, and he can be great. He just, you know, every now and then he just has one of those games where the ball starts floating and, and, um, you know, if, and USC is as good as they, as they are in the, in the shoot, there's probably one of the better teams in the country when it comes to being opportunistic. They, they've got 14 takeaways and they have none. So, you know, they're, they're pretty good at that. So, then I assume that Utah would do the same thing against Chance if he, if you know, if you let if you let them do it. They they just need to they need to block a little better, and he just needs to make a little bit better decisions. But the the main thing to me is they got to get the running game going to where it's where it's really effective, and they're not sitting there in third and eight as much as they were against USC because that 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 just makes it too easy for a defense like Utah or, or USC to to take advantage of it in that situation. Uh, kind of keeping on the same lines of the running game, last year Utah brought in a top 25 run defense and Oregon State was able to average about a little over six yards a carry against this Morgan Scally-led defense. Talk about Deshaun Fenwick and how you've kind of seen him evolve as a running back and what 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 do you look, what are you looking for as far as his matchups going forward on Saturday? Well, at this point, it's not really Fenwick so much as it's 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 a three it's a three headed uh, running back. It's kind of a committee deal at this point. They they're they're kind of letting it play out to see if one of these guys really takes over the job. Fenwick has been starting, um, but I mean, on a series, you'll see all three of them in there, and usually, the guy will be in there two or three plays. He's out. Then it's Damian Martinez, and then it's Jam Griffin. One of those three, and you know the, la- the you know the last impression is Jam Griffin is is suddenly the you know the the favored guy. I mean he had 82 yards on 12 care. I think it was 84, 82 or 84. Yards. But he had five five of his 12 carries were for over 10 yards against SC, including one of the touchdowns. So you know it's just a matter of one of those guys eventually taking over the job. And and right now Griffin is you know I don't. I'm not saying he's going to start Saturday, but right now he's, he's the hot back and he, he does have some quality behind him. I, you know, he's, he's a transfer from Georgia tech. Um, he played some there, but I mean, he was a, he was a big time prospect out of high school. And I, 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 based on the USC game, I mean, I, I expect to see, see what he could do, see if he can pair that up with a, you know, even bigger effort than he said he did a week ago. I have to admi- admit, watching Oregon State this year, he's uh, Jack Coletto has been one of my favorite players to watch. Obviously, he's he's a linebacker, and so he lines up on defense, but he's getting a lot of uh, goal line play or, or short yardage situations to really extend the plays. What what does it mean to be able to have a guy like Jack Coletto to be able to just be that Swiss Army knife type player for Oregon State? 
you you're that you broke up on that last part. Did you ask what Coletto means to the offense? Yeah, just the offense or the team in general, just with him being able to be kind of the versatile player everywhere. Well, he's I mean, he's the most popular player on the team for for sure. I mean, cuz he's just he's on everything. He, you know, he plays a fair amount inside linebacker. He, he you know, he's in on offense that he can play quarter, he can play wildcat quarterback, he can play running uh, running back, fullback, H back. He's got lined up as a receiver. Um, he he plays all four special teams. I mean, he's just unique. I get I get fans asking, you know, well, who's Jonathan uh, recruiting to be the next Coletto? And I go, they're not. He's he's he's, he's a unicorn. He's you know, he's one of these guys you're not going to find very often because he's 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 big. He's he's been a quarterback. He played quarterback in high school and he did in junior college. He was recruited to Oregon State as a quarterback. And he he started against Colorado in 2018 at quarterback. Um, so he knows how to read a defense. So that's what kind of makes him effective as the wildcat guy. Plus, he's just he's just a brute. I mean, he's two forty. He's got a little bit of speed to him. I mean, he's broke a couple of runs during his career for touchdowns, long runs. He had one this year, 40, 41 yards for a touchdown in Boise State. I mean, if he gets through the line and and he gets the seam, he 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 can pick up big yards. So, but he's really popular because you know he's a good he's a you know he's a He's a friendly guy, and he, you know he 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 knows who he is. He he doesn't try to be any, you know he doesn't try to be anything more than he is, but he's willing to do anything, and he pretty much does. Outside of Coletto, who is your other player to watch for on this uh, defensive side for the Beavers? Well, on defense, I mean, we keep keep waiting for an outside linebacker to to really break out, but but so far that hasn't happened. I mean. Again, you know, I have to go back to the secondary. And Rajon Wright is really, you know, he's really the most, I would say, outside of Luke Musgrave, the tight end, who who won't play, you know, much like Frank Keithy. Um, you know, neither one's going to play. And that's kind of unfortunate because, you know, they might be the best two receivers on the field if, if they both played. Um but Rajon Wright is, you know, he's he, he's been he's been locked down for, for for most of the season. His brother his brother plays for the Dallas Cowboys, Nashon Wright, and you know he's he came back for his came back for his senior year to he could have went to the NFL this last year and, and got a tryout, but he wanted to, he wanted to get a little bit more polish on his game, and so he came back, and so far it looks like it's paid off. But I I'd, I'd say I'd say I mean, I mean the other guy that's in on a lot of plays is. Jaden Grant's in a lot of plays. He's a he's the seventh year safety that I mentioned earlier. He's been in the program all seven years too, it's, which is really unusual. There's been some seven year guys around college football. Usually they transferred in, and he's he's actually been here all seven years. So, um, you know, he's in a lot of plays. He's he's one of their one of their leaders on the team. You you kind of tipped your hand a little bit in the in an earlier question about kind of uh, how you see Utah winning this game, but in in your eyes, what what do you see? I guess what how do you see Oregon State winning this game, knowing that you know they they beat them last year, so this isn't like an uh, an, uh, an impossible thing. But what do you see this? Uh, how do you see Oregon State doing this? Well, I mean, last year they won the game because they got a block punt for a touchdown that got things that got things rolling. I kind of think they need something, something similar. Not, not necessarily a block punt, but they need some takeaways that give them a, a couple of short fields for scoring opportunities. You know, they, they've been pretty good with takeaways. They've just been inconsistent. They, you know, the two that get Fresno and, uh, or excuse me, Boise State and Montana State combined, they had eight turnovers. The other two games they had zero. So. You know, if they can get a couple of takeaways that lead to some some easy scores, I think that's one way. I, I don't know that Oregon State's going to win the game straight up if they have to go the length of the field, you know, four or five times for scores. Because I I don't, I don't see Utah just you know giving up, and getting gashed at home with, for a lot of yards. So somehow they they need to come up with some, and they you know they they, they can't let Utah and they can't let Utah's tight ends go run wild and and the, and the running game they can't. They've been pretty good against both the running game and and defensively in general. They've been pretty good, but I think they need I think they need a couple of you know just you know plays that that you that you're not maybe not sort of counting on in the game. But I think it's going to be close regardless of how, how it plays out. A blowout either way would 
surprised me a lot. You know, keeping on the th- same theme of turnovers, Chance Nolan obviously throws for the four against USC. In your opinion, was it something that USC was doing? Was it just an off night by Nolan? Like what, what, how did you kind of see that kind of play out? Oh, I'd say it's a combination of, of both. Um, I mean, USC, that was USC's best defensive game by far. I, I would say in the four, you, you look at the four interceptions, two of them were, were pressure, were pressured interceptions. Um, where he threw off his back foot and just floated it up there. Um, the third interception was they were trying to take a shot near the goal line. He, he threw, you know, he, he threw, you know, it was about a forty-five or fifty-yard pass, and and the and the corner kind of got away with a little bit of a, a little bit of a hold and, and and made a great play on the ball. Um, the, the fourth interception was the you know the the last the last offensive play where you know he threw in a triple coverage. I. I don't know. I mean, they were trying. They were trying to get. They needed to get in the field goal range. I thought they need. They, they didn't need to, be, need to be that desperate because they had timeouts and things like that. But so I, I mean, for sure, it was two of them were on chance. And the third one, you know, was kind of a situational type thing. And the fourth one, they were just taking a shot. But um, yeah, USC is. I mean, if you give a USC the ball in a place where they can catch it, they're going to catch it and make you pay for sure. I mean, the, not every team. I mean, not every team can do that. Even if you give them give them chances, they don't make those plays. USC does. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you to Salt Lake City and, and kind of enjoying the, the air. The rains come in, so it's uh, taken away some of the the cl- uh, cloudier type stuff. But it's uh, it's good weather here, and, and we look forward to having you here. But tell us tell us where uh, you know people can find you, whether they can hit you up and ask you about any Oregon State stuff. Uh, well, all my all my stuff is on OregonLive dot com, and then obviously I have a Twitter handle at Nick Dashel. Um, right, I answer a lot of questions for you know mostly Oregon State people have questions, but uh, yeah, that's where you can reach me. So, is, is it raining down there right now? Uh, it has been for the last two days. Yesterday was kind of a, a downpour, but uh, so it probably feel a little like home with Portland, but uh, not not too bad now. Oh, today was the first. It's rain here today, but it's like the first time it's rained here in, in shoot a couple months. Kind of, um, but sa- Saturday's not supposed to be rainy, is it? No, it's supposed to be pretty clear. So, but you never know when yeah, you talk. Yeah. It kind of changes from from time to time. We've we've been in a really tough drought, so uh, any rain that we yeah. can get is is good for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All awesome. Thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you on Saturday and and uh, seeing this game played out. All right, sure. Okay, thanks for having me. That's Nick Dashel from the Oregonian. He covers Oregon State Athletics. Uh, it's always good to be able to get perspective from another team and, and being able to uh, just kind of see what how they, they view the team. Obviously, they're the ones that, that cover the team the most. Um, like he mentioned near the, the very end of that, the, the fact that you know Oregon State's missing one of their tight ends as well, Luke Musgrave, it's really unfortunate to be able to see that both of these teams aren't going to have their top tight ends uh, these these teams kind of resemble themselves a lot on offense and kind of how they they structure things. So uh, it's a little it, it's a little unfortunate that we uh, don't get that. But um, I, I you know I think these teams are going to have to find a different way to win, and and it's going to be a fun one. I think yeah you know I think it's going to be fun. I mean Rob, do you agree with him that this is going to be a maybe a, a slugfest that it's going to be a low scoring affair? Well, I mean, Utah's going to be struggling to move the move the ball through the air. I mean, I'll tell you that when they were able to hold a prolific USC offense that was seemingly throwing for nearly 400 yards a game, and they held them to 180. So, I mean, that uh, that alone, the uh, the secondary, like he mentioned, played lights out in that game. So. And, you know, that that last play where the Jordan Addison gets a touchdown, that the safety is like a second late. And, that, and it's a game of inches, right? That's just how it plays out. But uh, I think that Utah, if they're going to have success, it's going to have to be on the ground. The Tavion Thomas, Makai Bernard, and now Jaquindon Jackson. He'll, he'll get thrown into the mix along with uh, Jalen Glover. So I kind of see expect to see all four running backs get their shot and kind of uh, kind of uh, similar to what Oregon State will do where they're kind of going to ride the hot hand kind of see who's going to be the one that's going to fight for those extra yards. And in, in a game like this, I think field position and uh, the turnover uh, battle is going to be absolutely key. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think, you know, both teams are going to have to establish the run. Um, it's it's going to be one of those games where there's not going to be a lot of passing. Uh, at least I don't think so, right? Like sometimes, you know, Ludwig will come out there and surprise us or different things will happen. Um, but I, but I really, yeah, we, we thought that last week too, well, that's right? True. And we, they went we thought fast. that Utah was gonna, it was gonna run all over ASU, and Utah was determined to to, to throw it. And so there was must have been something in their film review that they saw that saw a weakness that they could exploit. So yeah, we, I guess we could be um, totally off base here. Um, but uh, I mean, this is two weeks in a row where the game plan is obviously um, going to be run heavy. Well, at least from our perspective, mm-hmm. that it should be run heavy. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, there's a lot of motivation on this side, right? Like, they, they felt like they, you know, they, they had the game last year. For the most part, the offense was actually playing really well. Um, things weren't going perfect, right? Like, it's not like the offense was just lights out. But for the most part, the offense was doing its job. It was just on the other end of the ball where the defense just couldn't wrap up. They couldn't tackle. They couldn't do whatever they needed to do. And then, like Nick mentioned, there was that blocked punt that really just killed Utah's chances and, uh, you know, limited what they were able to do. And so, you know, you mentioned being able to have that turnover battle, right? Like, obviously, Chance Nolan threw threw four interceptions against USC, and the fact that they only lost was as close as they did is pretty impressive that that defense can can kind of lock up uh, USC and and be able to do that. Uh, You know, there's there's obviously some things going on with USC, and we'll see how that shakes out and, and see if... You know, they were kind of a pretender to some extent, or if, if this was just U.S. or Oregon State is that good. Um, but the only thing that would give me pause to say that this won't be a defensive slugfest in the sense on Utah's side is that how much they want this game, right? I, I, I don't think they're going to be sleeping on Oregon State. They know that Oregon State is a good team. They understand that Jonathan Smith has done a phenomenal job of getting this program to a much better uh, middle-of-the-road destination, right? Like, they're still not quite to that upper echelon. I think they're getting there. Um, but they're not going to, you know, they're not going into this game thinking that Oregon state's just this, you know, pass by game that they're going to, they're going to win and, and then move on to UCLA next week. I think the the benefit here is that they have their full attention. You've got a defense that's seemingly hitting its stride and, you know, we'll see what happens, obviously taking out Brant Keithy, that's going to change things, but, uh, I'm curious to see how this goes and if it will be a defensive slugfest or if this is going to be one of those games where Utah really tries to establish itself early really tries to push that tempo like we saw in uh, Arizona State and and really just kind of put Oregon State to bed quickly. So with with that, um, obviously, you know, the, the defense for Oregon State has been pretty stout. Um, they are 10th in the nation with interceptions. They've got six. Um, they've been able to do a great job of being able to do whatever they need to do. They've had um, 24 passes defended. 18 of those have been pass breakups. That's also 10th in the country. This is a defense that is opportunistic. They're ready. They're ready to do whatever they need to to be able to uh, make the opposing quarterbacks pay. Um, and so I think that's going to be interested, interesting to be able to look at. Do you, do, you, do you see Utah struggling in this area if they decide to open up that passing game? No, I, I think that Andy Ludwig is going to dial up some safe passes. And I don't see, uh, as has been the case for the majority of the season, we haven't seen a ton of downfield uh, shots taken largely due to um, the mismatch in the tight end game. They're trying to get the ball out quick. So I, I don't, I don't really anticipate it changing Utah's uh, game plan, but if you were to look at as, as far as Oregon state's defense, if you were to look up in the rest of the country, the, the rest of the conference, the rest of the PAC 12, there isn't a more similar team to Utah than Oregon state. They're the, the blue chip um, play it tough every, every single week. And the, you have to really admire the way that Jonathan Smith has built this program up back from, I mean, they, uh, they've they really took a nosedive ever, ever since Mike Riley took off for Nebraska. So they really haven't been uh, relevant, um, you know, until recently, until he took over. And now all of a sudden here they are, they were undefeated going to, um, you know, home versus USC and really took them down to the wire. And if you don't throw four interceptions, if you win the turnover battle, that's a completely different ball game, maybe even blow out USC. So this is a very capable defense, and I don't really anticipate Utah taking a ton of chances on offense. I think they're going to play it safe. They're going to throw it out in the flat quite a bit. They're going to do some swing passes to the running backs and really kind of see 
the the question for Utah is how can you replace Brant Kesey? Because on paper you you just can't. But uh, they're going to try. And how are they going to try to get that short to intermediate passing game at least? enough of a threat so that Oregon state has to stay respectful of it. Otherwise they're just going to stack nine guys in the box um, and dare Utah to throw it over the top. And so we'll see what happens, but it's going to be one of those chess match type games where the both coaches are going to be adjusting to try to slow down whatever side. And if you're, if you're Utah up until this point, outside of that Florida game, you have been able to make those in game adjustments and, um, that has to be a positive. Now, the, the, I mean, the level of difficulty obviously goes back up this week. You kind of had uh, in for your opponents your last three games. Um, and so this is going to be your first real true test um, since that Florida game. So we'll see how they respond. Well, and I think I think you mentioned what you mentioned there about you know replacing Brent Keithy is is people forget that Dalton Kincaid's still there, right? I mean, like this isn't something that Utah is completely um worried about i mean it, it's definitely going to impact the game right like we're not going to sit here and say that you take brant keithy out of an offense and, and everything's just going to go ho-hum and and maybe it can um, but i think the the scenario that utah has with dalton kincaid he becomes a, a big target and a big threat for oregon state that they can't load up that box even if you you know put double coverage on on dalton kincaid or something they're still going to roll out a Thomas Yasmin, you know, and being able to put him out there. And maybe he's not as capable as the, you know, the, the two people in front of him. Um, but we also don't know that either, right? Like we haven't seen a lot of opportunities from him. He's He's been uh, overlooked in a lot of ways because of who's in front of him. And his his understanding of football is still growing, right? He's still understanding what it is after being a rugby player for his whole life. So, you know, I, I think Oregon State still has to respect Utah's ability to be able to uh, spread the field that way and, and being able to not know where Utah's going to go. It, it would be easy to say, oh, they're going to load up the box and, and worry about Tavion Thomas or Jalen Glover or any of these other guys back there. But the reality is, is any of those tight ends can escape and they can make you pay as as Yasmin did with that 72 yard run. So it, it'll it'll be interesting. I'm curious to see how that all shakes out. But, you know, I think, it, you know, I think simply because Utah is going to be focused on this game, I think that's going to help them. I think their special teams is in a much better scenario, at least punting wise. The coverage hasn't been great on two of those plays against Arizona State. So. Um, that could cause some pause, but but I think it really does come down to that turnover battle, right? Is Chance Nolan the guy that's going to be able to do it for Oregon State? Can Cam Rising do it for Utah? We've seen him make some great plays, but we've also seen him try to thread the needles in areas that he really shouldn't be able to do. I, I mean, you, you look at Dalton Kincaid's second touchdown where he had to grab it over three guys, essentially. That's probably not a throw you want him to make, but you also have a talented tight end that is able to make that play. So... Like you said, this is going to be very much so a turnover battle. Um, and who's going to have that that winning margin? Who's going to be able to do it? And who's going to come on that other end uh, with a victory? So I think it'll be a fun uh, game. This it's going to be it's going to be one on first and second down. Just like uh, Nick had mentioned, like if you can get into third and short, whether you're Utah or whether you're Oregon State, well, that opens up your playbook quite a bit because whether you're trying to be aggressive like Kyle Whittingham and potentially go for it on fourth and short or you want to take a couple shots on third down. Um, like if you're in third and long throughout the majority of this game against a very aggressive defense, that's going to blitz multiple guys on <laughs> seemingly every passing down that you're going to have, it's going to be tough to provide the blocking required for these plays to develop. And so I feel like, if Utah can get the push on the offensive line on first down and try to be net positive, you know, we're, we're talking about at least four, four to five yards on first down, four to five yards on second down. Well, then it's suddenly you're looking at third and two or third and one, or even moving the change in your first two downs. And then, you know, over the course of the game, you, you take your calculated risks at taking some shots down the field, but, uh, this is this is going to be a game. It's like you know, for for Utah fans of old, this is going to be like the you know playing Air Force, where every yard is going to be a fight, and time of possession is going to be. These are two programs that pride themselves on you know time of possession and controlling the tempo of the game and keeping the other offense, the other team off the field, and so turnovers are are going to be like a double shot in the foot on this one. Turnovers, penalties, uh, anything that's going to get you off of your down and distance. 
uh, goal is going to be paramount for for both of these programs. But I still see Utah coming out in top. But yes, I I, I see the Vegas line at 10, 10 and a half. I think it opened up at like 11 and a half. I think it's going to go down closer to the seven, six and a half point range just because I just don't I see points being a, a premium in this game. But with the, that, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's it's one of those games where 10 points, could it happen 100%, but I, I see it being a much slimmer margin just simply because this is two teams that are kind of identical, a lot of blue chip, not blue chip, but blue collar guys, I should say, uh, where, you know, there's, especially on Oregon State side on offense, they don't necessarily have that name that is going to be flashy, right? Like people aren't looking at Oregon State and saying, oh, they have this guy. They've got phenomenal players, but they're not the flashy names. And, and to some extent, Utah's that same way, especially with Brant Keithy out of the offense. So, I, you know, I think this is one of those games that's going to be, you know, really close. It's going to be something that, you know, it, it could blow up in, on either side of this if, if the turnover battle becomes um, lopsided. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be a fight. So, you know, I, I, I guess so, my next question would to, to, to you would be is what, what gives you confidence for Utah in this game? Just the way that they've played. Um, we, we talked to Solomon Enos on our podcast on uh, Monday or Tuesday, and you could hear it in it and uh, go to KSL.com, check out the Utah Checkdown podcast, and you can go down and listen to that one. But uh, he, he mentioned something like the Utah has gotten better every week, and yet, yet they still have so much potential that they have yet to achieve. And that, that gives you hope as a Utah fan that they haven't played their best game yet, yet they're beating these inferior opponents pretty convincingly. And yeah, I mean, Arizona State um, was simply outmatched. Utah completely dominated that game from start to finish, was never close. And that's, you know, it, it's not like Arizona State. I mean, they're a P5 program. They have, they have, I believe they have more four-star athletes than they, than Utah does, if I'm not mistaken. So they have the athletes on the field, but Utah with its development with under Kyle Whittingham, Morgan Scally on defense, they were able to completely dominate that line of scrimmage and really force Arizona state. We, we talk about um, third and long. I mean, Arizona state was in third and long almost all game. So I, I feel like Utah's defense is going to be the deciding factor in this one. Can they hold Oregon state to those third and longs themselves and then capitalize if you're, if, 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 if it's third and eight and you're not sending the house, if you're Morgan Scally, if you don't have, you know, confidence in, in your man schemes on the back end that, you know, and, and really pressure a, a quarterback that just seemingly threw four interceptions last week, because that's what USC did, right? I mean, they put pressure on Oregon State and Chance Nolan didn't adjust well. Um, he ended up throwing four interceptions. Yeah, two of them were probably on his receivers, just not making the catch. Uh, but uh, if you're Utah, you have to be really looking forward to that battle. And, and then a little bit of the revenge factor, right? Like, this was your only conference loss last season. Um, and it, it, it was a game where you were up 14 nothing. It seemed like everything that you were doing uh, right offensively and defensively was working. And all of a sudden, you could feel the tide, that you could feel the momentum start to, to slip. And then you have a blocked punt. You should have had two of them, if not for some fluky I think it got called back, equipment. Didn't it? it was like an equipment malfunction. Like mm-hmm. you had a player, two players on the field wearing the same jersey number or something like that. I mean, you, honest, in all honesty, you probably should have had two blocked punts for touchdowns in that game. So um, th- that is your concern. And uh, I guess if you were to look at uh, you know concerns, special teams outside of the field goal kicking, I, I would give that a pass because I think that that's been really solid. The, the punting has been close to getting blocked. It, they haven't had one blocked, but it's still been close, uh, too close for comfort, I would say. And your coverage on kickoffs have been abysmal at best. If your kicker is having to make tackles, uh, <laughs> yeah. two of them, especially like touchdown saving tackles, good tackles, that is not good. That is not good. So um, those are the, the momentum swinging plays that you can see. Uh, go, you know, for either side, for Utah or for Oregon State, that could could be the deciding factor and and kind of swinging that momentum. Like, what do you see from Utah's offense against this tough Oregon State defense, and what gives you confidence that they'll be able to move the football? 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, before that, I think I had agreed with you on the defense, right? And, and, and I probably would have said that as well. But for me, the thing that gives me confidence is Utah's offensive line. Uh, we didn't really see a lot of their push last week against Arizona State. They they kind of got pushed around a little bit, so you know that could give you some pause. But I think the way that this this group is playing together, they've got a lot of experience. They've been able to really establish what they want to do. Gives me pause that they'll be able to be okay, right? They're going to be able to handle the the blitzing and the and the different pressures that that Oregon State's going to dial up, and really kind of give Cam the pocket that he needs to work with. Now, does that mean that everything's going to be perfect and that you know? when we come back on Monday and we talk about this game, the offensive line is going to shine. I mean, for Utah's sake, you hope so, right? But I, but I think there's going to be some mistakes. There's going to be things that people are frustrated with. But this is a physical team. But I think that the way that Utah's, you know, built, this, this is going to be okay, right? They've got their offensive line that's, that's stout. They can do what they need to. If you really need to go into an 11 or 12 I don't think they can really kind of get into that 13 personnel now. They can, but it's it's a little different in how they can operate it with Brandt out. I, I you know I think they're going to be okay in, in being able to establish that. And if they can do that, I think if they can really you know uh, establish themselves as being the physical force and creating those holes, Utah's run game is going to be fine, right? We saw when Tavion got into the game just how much more he took that game. Um, you know, obviously he has to control what he's doing right now in his life and 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 really being able to get himself on the field. And if he's able to do that, I think he makes it really difficult on Oregon state to be able to stop him. Uh, I think he's effective. And then you throw in some other guys, maybe it is Jaquindon Jackson, you know, with he's kind of a bigger body, like uh, Tavion Thomas and, and being able to, you know, get off the edge and, and have some speed. If they can do that though, if that offensive line can set the tone of this game and, and set the physicality of it and, and be able to really own in on that. I, I don't think Utah has a problem in this game because I think that run game will be effective and, you know, Oregon State has they've given up a fair amount of yards, right? They're not they're not bad, but they're not terrible or they're not good either in, in terms of run defense. They're a good team, but they can be beatable. So I think that's what gives me pause or not necessarily pause uh, confidence in this Utah offense. Hey, you saw it last week against USC where um, Oregon State at uh, the first play of the game on offense for USC was a 40 yard run by Travis Dye. And, you know, you look at who took the go-ahead touchdown at the end was obviously Jordan Addison on a beautiful throw by Caleb Williams. But uh, the touchdown before that also came on the ground. So I feel like um, USC was able to be effective in running the football. And, you know, if you're if you're game planning against this Oregon State defense, you'd, you would think that you would take a similar approach where, um, you know, Tavion Thomas is going to get a heavy dose of carries and you're just going to try to grind out um grind out those those first downs and control the possession and really and really force Oregon State to be the one to be on the offensive and to be the one to to gamble and to to, to be taking the risks and to make a mistake especially with the home crowd at Rice Eccles I expect a, a full house uh what, how many sellouts in a row are they up to I've yeah. lost track honestly I should probably know better as the beat writer but here I am <laughs> it, 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 it's tough because you know it, it's a day game and everybody's gonna have you know everybody has like the youth conference football and they have other obligations for their kids and you know it's a general conference weekend it, it, it it's it's unfortunate that this game isn't like a prime time night game because I feel like this is um, the game of the weekend in the Pac-12, you know, outside of the U- UCLA Washington game, which happens to be on a Friday, this is the the marquee matchup in my opinion, um, and and it's really two blue blue collar programs that are going to be going head to head, and I think the really deciding factor in this one will be the turnover battle. And Utah's done fairly well so far. You know, they had the two interceptions against Arizona State. We didn't see any fumbles. Um, I'm trying to think of the last fumble lost. Was it uh, Southern Utah, where uh, yes. they uh, Southern Utah was able to get its lone touchdown of the game? I yep. think it was Tavian Thomas that put mm-hmm. the ball on the turf. So I mean, ball security. <laughs> it, 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 it's a. Uh, it, it, it's hard because as a, as a player, you're trying to fight for extra yards. You're trying to, you know, stiff arm, juke, do whatever you can, but ball security is, is more important than any of that. Um, um, and so what, what I've liked so far out of the season is when Utah's had to play younger players, a uh, Jalen Glover, especially to Quinton Jackson, they haven't made mistakes. They haven't put the ball in the turf. And so you look at, um, you know, this game when people, 
I, I, I would just preach that they don't try to do too much in trying to replace Brant Keith. They just do your role and realize that it's a team game. And if everybody does their one eleventh, then you can be successful on offense. And you don't need to do, you know, two or three or four different players' roles. You just need to do your own. And, you know, as, if, if you get to touch the football, you got to take care of it. If you're Solomon Eunice, you got to bring it in and not try to run before the catch like he talked about on Tuesday. So I feel like if – if you were to let me ask you this, if you were to take two players on offense to try to uh, that may see a, a increased role in Utah's offense, I have two in mind, but I want to hear what you who you think will kind of be the uh, kind of like the uh, the replacement, sort of speak for 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 Brent Keithy in the passing game. I mean, that's obviously got to be Thomas Yasmin, right? I mean, I mean you, you could go with Dalton Kincaid, but I think Thomas is going to be that guy that gets the opportunities and, and is able to to really kind of show us what he, he can do. He's a big guy, right? I mean, he's 6'5", 250 pounds. Um, he, he's able to, to rumble down the field, and he's got some speed. So uh, I think he's definitely one of those guys that's going to be able to do it. On the other end, I'm kind of in a mixture between two players um, in terms of, of kind of the run game, right, where – uh, you're, you're going to try to see them establish different things. To me, I see somebody like a Jalen Dixon or a Jaquindon Jackson being effective in this game, right? Maybe you get some sweet plays. Maybe you get some reverses, whatever it may be, to try to be able to get just kind of relax that defense a little bit and force them to really uh, keep you honest in a lot of respects. So I would say maybe two of those three, three of those players uh, can really be kind of the impact players. That's that's assuming that, you know, we already uh, see these other guys that are effective and are able to do stuff. But I can see those guys being that next level player that is able to kind of take it to the to, to where Utah needs to go and be able to make it a well-rounded uh, offense. What do, what do you think? I'm going to go in a different direction. You went with uh, Yasmin and the uh, combination of the running backs. I'm going to go with uh, two different receivers. I think Jalen Dixon and Money Parks are going to be a little – they're going to get chances, um, and then it's up to them to see how they do with it. So we've seen uh, Brant Keithy throughout the season take some end rounds uh, a little bit more last season. Uh, it, it was a little bit more featured, but, yeah, he, he was able to do some end around runs. I see Jalen Dix, Dixon filling that role. And then in the inter, the short to intermediate passing game, I see a slot receiver, somebody in the middle that's able to – to find a, a a soft spot in the defense. And that's what made Keithy so invaluable to Cam Rising. And that's why we saw Cam kind of look towards Keithy almost nearly every play is he found a way to get open. And that's not to say that these other receivers aren't good at that. It's just when you can depend on that guy to get that mismatch, to get that yard of separation, to, to create those throwing lanes. Uh, that's what you're kind of looking for uh, as a quarterback. So I kind of see, uh, Jalen Dixon and, and uh, Money Parks kind of having a more featured role in this offense. And it'll be inter- interesting to see how Andy Ludwig adjusts to um, trying to replace Brent Keithy. I, that, 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 I'm not trying to say that Dalton Kincaid and Thomas Yasmin are not going to be featured in the offense. I think that they, they will be. But I think that Utah is going to go more one tight end sets uh, and try to throw in another receiver. And, um, you know, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I, you know, I think we, we've talked a lot about this Oregon State game, and I think there's there's not much more we can really try to decipher, right? Because this is going to be a game between two tough teams. It's going to be a great opportunity to really establish uh, the pecking order in the Pac-12 and really see if Utah has what it takes to be able to be where they need to be, or at least where they think they need to be. So uh, it'll be an interesting game. But bef- before we kind of close out this podcast, Rob, I'm just more curious, kind of what, what game outside of this one, it doesn't have to be in Pac-12 play, it can be, what game are you most looking forward to outside of that? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the rivalry game tonight down in Provo, Utah State versus BYU kind of has lost a little bit of its luster with the news that uh, Logan Bonner is out for the season with a broken foot. Um, it's uh, – you wonder how much of it was he was playing through in, in the first couple of weeks. Obviously, he – um, they, they weren't the same team speaking towards Utah state. Um, BYU seems to have, has established itself as, a, you know, a good program. So I, I don't see this get this game being, being all that close. Let me just run through the schedule. Um, you know, I, I feel like Alabama has been tested, um, with the, the game at Texas. And I feel like they're going to get another shot here, uh, against Arkansas mm-hmm. and, 
uh, it's hard for these top tier programs because everybody's gunning for you, right? That's uh, for Utah. Everybody's going to be trying to knock you off because you're the defending champions, right? And so I feel like, uh, you know, the Arkansas Alabama game has some intrigue. Uh, you know, Arkansas obviously lost. I, I didn't know it was possible to to hit the top of a goalpost on a field goal yeah, and then have it bounce that? out. That like, was incredible. I mean, you you talk about a game of like just inches. Yeah, the, the, I mean, one inch to the left, and that's that's a good kick, right? Like, I mean, that's a, that's a that's a five mile an hour wind gust that just kind of shoes it in. I don't know. So uh, that's kind of one that catches my eye. The uh, Kentucky Old Miss game. So, I mean, that's two SEC games, but uh, in the Pac-12, obviously the uh, UCLA, because Utah will play them next week at, versus Washington, that could be a game where, you know, in our staff selections, I don't think I'm the only one that's picking UCLA just because it, it is at home. And, it, yeah, I, I get that it's not going to be this raucous crowd and there really isn't that much of a home field advantage, but we don't really know a lot about Washington. Um, their biggest win so far was against the team that's, um, has been mediocre at best in the Big Ten. So that those are kind of the games I'm keeping an eye on. What about you? Yeah, I think I, I definitely want to see the Washington-UCLA game. Are, are either one of these teams as good as their record reflects? Uh, Washington, you know, they beat Michigan State, and, and that looked like a great win at the time. Who You know, Michigan State was ranked. Um, but they've really kind of fallen off since then. So I'm, I'm curious to see if this is real, if we do see a Michael Penix Jr. that is, a, is as good as we think he is, or if you know Washington is just kind of benefiting based on their schedule. Uh, but on the flip side, UCLA, I mean, they, they haven't really played anybody this year. I mean, last week was Colorado, which is literally the worst team in Power 5, if not maybe all of FC, FBS football. Um, there's some bragging rights in some other respects for for worse teams. Colorado State might challenge them on that one. It's too bad we don't get those two playing this year. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I think that game is going to tell a lot in the Pac-12. And and then like you mentioned in the SEC that that Kentucky Ole Miss game. I think that's really exciting. I think that's a fun game. You've got two teams that uh, are really doing well. Kentucky, not necessarily your your traditional powerhouse in football. Uh, they come in ranked higher against a, a, a really well-coached Ole Miss team with Jackson Dart at quarterback. Uh, it, it, there's, there's a lot of fun football this week. There's a lot of ranked games this week where they, they play against each other. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. It, you know, if you haven't had a chance to uh, go sign up for our Pick'em, we pick five games each week. Uh, you know, two or three of those are the local games, and then we pick some national games. And it, it's just fun for you to guess the score, see if you can win some prizes. We give away some Visa gift cards. Um, so go ahead and, and, and check on that at KSL.com. Um, it's, a, it's a fun opportunity. But we appreciate you uh, listening in to the Utah Checkdown podcast and, and joining us today. Uh, go ahead and, and rate us on your, your favorite fo- podcast platform. Uh, hit us up if you have any questions or anything that you wanted us to talk about. But with that, we will uh, sign off today and, and prepare for the Oregon State game. And uh, then we will recap it again next week, hopefully again with Solomonina. So thanks for listening.